have a 15 minute question and answer period. So if you do have some questions, hang on to them and you'll have an opportunity to ask them before we break for lunch. It's my pleasure to now introduce Halton Cheadle, who hails to us from South Africa, where he teaches at the University of Cape Town. He's also, he does legal consulting in the fields of labor, constitution, and electoral law. Mr. Cheadle had the privilege of studying law, I don't know if I'm allowed to mention this, but I will, under house arrest while he was an active anti-apartheid activist, I, I presume, in his law school days. He negotiated the peace accord with, with the ANC, subsequently participated in the negotiations of the interim and final constitution for South Africa. He chaired a ministerial task force for developing new the new labor law regime in South Africa. So he's got quite an interesting history and he's focused um, primarily in labor, constitutional and human rights law. And without further hesitation, I welcome Halton Cheadle to the podium. Thank you very much. I, there's going to be a decided change in focus. Um, if you listen to the speakers this morning and the panel, the, the focus really between the drafter, the writer, and the text, um, and the law. And so the concerns are about the organizing of the document, the problems of ambiguity, um, the, the, the dangers of formalism, and um, the traditional concerns that uh, um, occur um, in the drafting process. And uh, it's not a mistake that that happens because that's how we think writers write. We think that they sit in their offices, they get instructions, and then they draft the document. And that the real issue, and um, the most important issue, of course, now is change taking the instructions, which might come in a whole range of ways, and turning, giving legal expression to those instructions, and then producing the legal text. Um, we're all very used to um, that conception of the drafter. And I, I would like to suggest that um, when we're dealing with complex transactions, and I am going to talk to you about extraordinarily complex uh, um, um, transactions, um, many of you may never have to um, engage in <laughs> transactions of this kind, but I think that there are a whole range of um, important issues that, are, that can assist in, let's say, less complicated um, transactions. Um, so by way of introduction, let's look really with what I would call um, um, a unilateral document or a unilateral drafting process. I start with the proposition that all drafting is a process and we tend to forget that. Uh, even if we take the process of drafting um, 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 what I call unilateral drafting or unilateral doc documents such as a will um, uh, or a donation, um, really if you think about it, there's a process. The process is you take instructions, you draft a document, you send it back to your client, unless you're arrogant, and um, try and get some feedback from your client, and then you finalize the document. And then finally, there's, there's, there's even the, the moment of execution. I and mean, it will obviously ensuring that the, all the formal requirements um, insofar as witnessing and signatures are, are dealt with. If we turn to a bilateral uh, transaction, again, lawyers are entirely comfortable here, particularly in uh, adversarial um, legal systems. Uh, one party is represented by a lawyer, uh, the other party is represented by a lawyer. They talk to each other, whether it's in litigation or in negotiation. It, um, it's, it's all particularly, uh, it's all uh, part of an everyday, everyday experience. And again, um, you take instructions, you prepare a draft, you send a draft to the other side, the other side takes instructions from client, um, sends in changes, or prepares a draft of their own. Um, how many of you here, even dealing with bilateral transactions, have um, had to deal with the fact that you have two drafts on the table, one from party A and another one from party B, and um, trying to ensure that your draft is the draft 
um, around which people negotiate, because all of us know that there is a tactical and strategic advantage getting other people to try and change your document than you trying to change their document. And so even in bilateral contracts, the, the issue of who produces the document first and which document you work off um, is um, an important um, consideration. Um, probably best if I just look at uh, what I have before me. And uh, I think when we reflect on bilateral transactions, um, we, we see that we use the everyday mechanisms of skills that use, lawyers use. It's typically adversarial. I don't mean acrimonious. I'm, I mean adversarial, though um, I would say a good half of, um, of, of contracts and, um, and legal documents I've dealt with, I would say acrimony would be the better description of it. Um, and that process-related skills um, are important. Um, the reputation of the lawyer. At the moment you're dealing with a well-renowned QC who's on the one side, it just makes it a lot easier, sometimes, not always, um, to, um, um, to, uh, to prepare a legal document. Trust, the degree of trust between the lawyers. Um, Self-confidence, I've come across so often um, young lawyers um, or inexperienced lawyers that do not have self-confidence and they're not too frightened, in fact, to advise their clients what would clearly be in their interest. And uh, again, you have real difficulties in trying to conclude the agreement, let alone um, conclude it in, in, um, uh, uh, in an effective way. And then I say social skills, um, those are process-related skills, and we all know that some um, just the manner in which lawyers approach each other, how they write to each other, how they deal with each other, um, can make an enormous difference in, in ensuring that a document is both completed, a uh, legal document is um, um, completed, but also it's, um, that it has coherence and some degree of consistency. I think when we turn to, sorry, to uh, multilateral transactions, I think you begin to see the complexity grows exponentially, not only because you've got many different parties, but invariably these transactions have many different clauses. Um, and some of the multilateral transactions that I want to talk to you today about um, um, you know, involve um, really thick documents um, with several um, hundred clauses. Um, transparency becomes very difficult um, to achieve. Uh, that just flows from the fact that um, if you have a document, you put the document, um, you circulate the document amongst the many parties, there are telephone calls between one lawyer and another, um, changes are made to that document in respect of which lawyer C and lawyer D um, or parties E and F don't have sight of and they are suspicious, they don't know what things have changed and what haven't changed. Of course technology has made that relatively easier. Um, um, in the sense that you can, um, um, you can, you can, you can identify um, changes by, by the use of, uh, of, of colored text. But that also requires a lawyer that's, that's trustworthy and that will, in, who will indeed um, uh, draw to the attention of the other lawyers or the other parties um, any changes in this evolving text. And I think, again, with um, these kinds of transactions, Again, process-related skills um, become important. I'm just thinking now, just in an informal way that one tends to de deal with this when you have four or five lawyers. If they can work together, the thing operates relatively easily. If they don't work together, it's a nightmare, and, a, and an expensive nightmare normally for the clients. And I think if we look at the way multilateral um, transactions are engaged in, one I think sees three types what I call unilateral drafting, adversarial drafting, and collegial drafting. What I mean by unilateral drafting is the parties and the lawyers and the parties, they get together, they uh, uh, get agreements, get a consensus, they go out and they ask one of the lawyers or someone from outside now to draft the document. I say, here are all the principles, here are all the instructions, go off and, and um, draft the document. Adversarial drafting, in a sense, that is passing the doc document from one party to the other, modifications are being made, 
um, and, you, and you really it's a, it's a form of serial bilateral drafting. You, you draft between A and B, and then B goes to B, between B and C, it goes back to A, and finally a document normally as cut and pasted from all the different um, 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 versions that are placed on the table, and you get a document. And the third then is collegial. Uh, my experience of that is we, we call our QCs um, senior counsel. Senior counsel will say, listen, this is too complicated to do by telephone and by, 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 by correspondence. Um, let's all meet in my chambers. There are only seven of us. We sit down, we do it by committee, and we try and, um, um, and produce a document. <clears throat> and I think then if we look at those approaches, I think there are three types of skills um, that are necessary for um, producing um, um, legal text in these complex situations. And I think they're expertise, I think they're facilitation skills, and I think they're drafting skills. And I think that when we, when we talk about expertise, well, we're lawyers. We're commercial lawyers, we're constitutional lawyers, we're labor lawyers, um, we, it, it's our area of expertise. Um, facilitation skills, we're not taught this very often at university, certainly not where I come from, and, um, and some of those skills are learnt just because some people are blessed with them and other people um, um, learn them in, the, in, in their law firms, but they become quite crucial for, for, for managing and facilitating a conclusion of a, a legal draft in a multilateral transaction. And thirdly, drafting skills. We all think we've got them. We pass law school. We, of course, we write. Of course, we write well, um, and, uh, and we never really. But we never really reflect on on our drafting. Um, I think the drafting skills become quite crucial here, precisely because if you've got a multilateral transaction, you also have a complicated document. And a complicated document, um, particularly where you're taking instructions from maybe five, ten, fifteen, twenty different sets of interests, then. Um, retaining some kind of consistency and coherence in the production of the document becomes, becomes utterly crucial. Now, my personal experience um, is, and the one I wish to draw on, um, has been, uh, you've had some introduction, um, is the Peace Accord. Um, this was a uh, interim and final constitutions and negotiating um, social accords, accords on the regulation of the labor market um, in southern Africa, South Africa, Namibia, Lesotho, um, and, um, and electoral laws in Lesotho. Uh, I don't have too much time, so I'm, going to, I'm just going to um, quickly go through, through some of them. Now, these may all appear to be statutory or quasi-statutory, but they mostly took place outside of a legislative um, um, context. The peace accord, although an important provision of the peace accord included amendments to the Criminal Procedure Act, uh, the accord itself was negotiated, um, it was purely consensual, and um, it was an agreement. It included a binding agreement at the end of the, in the, end of the day. Um, part of that agreement was that the apartheid government of the day would effect changes to the Criminal Procedure Act um, to fast track um, public violence trials and um, to establish a commission of inquiry. That commission of inquiry um, became known, um, I think, throughout the world. And here, too, there's the Goldstone Commission, which looked into um, the activities of the third force, um, one of the um, uh, groupings within society that were undermining um, our process, process towards a negotiated um, settlement. And so it, I think it is important to, to recognize that these are not, that although they deal with laws and they have a, um, um, a, a quasi-statutory type context, I think um, the lessons that arise from here are reproducible in a commercial context, in a um, in, 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 a, in, a, in a labor law context and in, in, in other contexts. So let me quickly turn now to the, um, to the peace accord. As I've said, um, it, it, the object was to secure 
um, ends to violence. It was a complicated document, involved a whole series of very complicated commitments, and um, some extraordinarily difficult issues, but only the types of issues that you would find in South Africa. Um, uh, the concept of um, we, we, we banned weapons. Um, one of the commitments was that you were not entitled to have any weapons in the streets. You were not allowed to. Um, and, uh, and that then raised the Zulu's right to have cultural weapons um, when, they, when they visit their king. Um, and the king kept on turning up at the, at the peace, uh, peace accord negotiations, causing a fair amount of difficulty. Um, but let me say to you, um, it, was, it was delicate. A hell of a lot hung on this, 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 this particular piece of cord. Um, it was very difficult circumstances to negotiate, an extraordinarily difficult process to manage. You had the apartheid government, you had the National Party, which was the governing party in that government, you had um, the ANC, you had the Encarta Freedom Party, you had other political parties, um, uh, you had then the NGO community, trade unions, um, churchmen, uh, um, um, present and the, the whole, uh, it, uh, and again, this was entirely consensual. There was, no, there was no vote at the end of this process. There was, had to be a buy-in or agreement by everybody. And just very briefly, as you can see, um, it involved commitments, um, peace structures. These were extensive peace structures throughout the country, made up in, in, in at national, regional, and local level, just to give you a just a little bit of colour, um, these local um, um, councils, peace councils, would have police representatives on them, ANC representatives. Bear in mind that barely a year before, um, the police were arresting ANC representatives because they belonged to a party that was illegal. Um, so ANC warring factions, we had the Encarta Freedom Party and the ANC present in the same local um, um, committees. So these things were, the drafting of this document was, was was complex because we had to cater for um, a whole range of issues that were not entirely predictable when they were, were implemented. There had to be procedures for dealing with disputes. There, had, there was establishment of the Commission of Inquiry that I've spoken about, and there were actually amendments to the Criminal Procedure Act. Now, the accord, the process was initiated by the apartheid government. That meant, anything initiated by that government meant a very high level of distrust. And the only manner in which that distrust could be resolved was, of course, to have very extensive negotiations over the format of the deliberations. It's, a, it's an issue that I, I want to raise later by saying that when we are faced with, let's say in a com commercial context, uh, dealing with, with um, uh, complex transactions, is that it may, may, not always, but it may be useful to think about, in fact, how you are going to conduct um, um, the negotiations. How are you going to produce the legal text? Start thinking about the format of that process rather than take it for granted, as one does do in, um, when one drafts a will for a client or one negotiates a contract um, for a client. The mechanisms, there were some interesting mechanisms. Use of independent facilitators drawn from civil society. Again, they didn't trust, not one politician trusted the other. I mean, that's standard form, but um, uh, it was um, the church and the trade unions that provided the facilitation. There was a development of a structure uh, for negotiations with a plenary, um, um, which is all the parties, and then the use of committees um, to, to do work and then report back. Now again, because this was a very, very complex process, part of the, part of the um, drafting process had to involve structure. Um, it may not need it if you have only seven parties and you can do, do it all in, in, um, in council's chambers. There had to be deadlock breaking mechanisms um, uh, and the, the technical mechanism here was facilitated bilateral meetings between, between the, the individual, individual parties. I mean, the, the whole accord turned ultimately on the definition of cultural weapon, um, and it was resolved ultimately between a delegation, um, an ANC negotiators and the Encarta Freedom Party negotiators, and it was negotiated um, two hours before um, the, all the dignitaries, including um, President Mandela, um, the Deputy President Mbeki, the head of the Encarta Freedom Party, um, were about to assemble um, in, the, in the hall to sign the accord. As a legal document, um, 
what um, occurred is that uh, I don't seem to have it on the board. No. I prefer loss, uh, less of me and more of the <laughs> text, if you don't mind. Um, so now I've got to go backwards. Sorry, I'm... The legal document really evolved um, in the process. So there was never any specific um, role given to a drafter. Um, it was integrated into the negotiations, and on occasions it, it, it became, um, when in fact negotiated the, 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 the legal draft um, in committee and it became the record of the agreement. Um, <clears throat> what are the important issues that I think that flowed from, um, from this is that independent facilitation was critical in a context of high levels of distrust. And that if you have a um, multilateral transaction where people do not trust each other, where there are sharp differences of views, then the, the use of an independent facilitator um, may well become become crucial. The I seem to have mixed things up. I just let me just drop the use of independent panels. It's really part of the interim constitution, um, and um, there were no no experts um, used at all in the peace accord. Um, but I think the process of securing and evolving agreement um, was fundamental. All agreements, so if, if one thinks about it, very often we just think the agreement is the contract, there it is, you sign it. Um, but to get um, to agreement on a contract or um, um, a legal document, which is itself um, internally very, very complex, you have, to, you have to eat the elephant one bite at a time. Um, and everyone is terrified of agreeing to something because they think that if they agree to something now, they're then going to be um, tie themselves into something later. And so a set of rules, I think, that are fundamental to the process is to recognize that agreement is, is, is an, um, an evolving process. And what you need to do then is to insist that all agreements are provisional. Agreed issues may be reopened at any time. And that disagreements are, we use the phrase, parked. If you have a disagreement, um, you don't want to stop and halt the process, the process should continue. You park that disagreement and then you try and find a way of dealing with it. And sometimes these, these disagreements are parked right along till the very end and then you have a look in, your, in, in, in the parking lot and you see there are 10 um, break points in your agreement. Everything else is finished and psychologically very often it's much easier to, to, to deal with those break points um, because so much has been achieved. Um, but you, you may well need to find mechanisms for resolving them. In the interim constitution, um, again, bear in mind that the interim constitution, although passed by um, um, the legislature, was, was drafted outside of the legislature because our legislature then was uh, a white legislature voted, um, appointed by, um, elected by a white uh, constituency and the um, negotiations towards an interim constitution took place outside of that environment and uh, there was an agreement um, that anything agreed to in the multi-party negotiating process would become law and they would not change a word of it when they put it into, um, into parliament. And this process, again, um, was a, uh, a, an extraordinarily complex um, um, process and um, I think Again, what I, I would like to draw from it is that um, there was an extensive pre-negotiation phase um, uh, for the procedure and an inordinately elaborate process of structure, of, of plenary committees, constitutional committees, um, technical committees, theme committees, all attempting to deal with um, getting agreement on a very complicated document. The mechanisms I think that were useful here. There were panels of facilitators. These were trusted politicians. By now, of course, we had moved. We'd been working with each other for at least three years, and there were politicians that were trusted, ANC politicians trusted by the National Party and National Party um, 
politicians trusted by the ANC. And indeed, the, 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 the two, a national party uh, politician and, uh, and an ANC politician, were the, um, right at the top of the process. They were the two that, that kept the, um, the process running. Um, there was the use of technical committees now, and now this is the introduction of expertise. There were technical committees with expertise who would feed into, into the system. The legal document, um, the technical committees provided reports with drafts of their respective sections, which were then approved by the, by the, by the political committees and the plenary structures, and those reports and drafts were submitted to drafters to develop a draft bill. Now what happened was that was the classic way one does it. You, it's like you, you're in a ministry, the ministry speaks to all the stakeholders, puts together a whole set of quasi-drafts, policies and the like, and then it, off it goes to, to, to a drafter. The drafter sat, was not at all part of the process, and then drafted the constitution from, from A to B. There were two drafters, but they weren't working together in the sense that they were um, trying to produce a single draft. They, one was drafting it in English, and the other one was drafting it in Afrikaans, um, the second language. But, but again, the drafter was not part of the process. When we look at the peace accord and we look at the constitution, what is the assessment one makes? I think it's this, that the peace accord, because there was no, there was no one drafter in, 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 um, um, in the control of the process, is that the document is patchy. It's, it's, it is, in fact, just sewn together. It's a whole range of agreements sewn together. It's not a coherent um, document. Um, thank God it never had to be interpreted. Um, uh, um, yeah, but uh, it performed its function. The interim constitution is a traditional legislative constitution. It's to take a statutory drafter and he turned it into statutory, ordinary statutory language and there was a lot of dissatisfaction about that constitution because it, um, it did not give proper legal expression to the agreements that were, that were reached. But it was too late and it had to, it had to get into the process um, um, in order to advance um, our move towards a constitutional democracy. So final constitution, this was a legislative process, but I think what is important again is that because consensus was so fundamental to creating a constitution, really what took place then within the constitutional assembly was to, um, to take all the lessons learnt from the um, interim constitution, and many of these people were now um, the same people, um, and to, to operate um, quite, um, quite differently from the manner in which you would expect a legislature to work. There were no votes. In other words, this was a machine to acquire consensus over a period of time. And the, the method of work was again a series of committees, and the work was divided up into themes, Bill of Rights, um, separation of powers, um, 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 federal um, division, um, etc. And then each theme committee filled with co uh, politicians would have a group of experts, technical experts that would work with them. And then each would produce um, a, 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 a draft. And these legal experts um, worked with the, with the, um, with the committee and, um, and then would produce uh, the first draft. What um, is important, I think, is that, um, that the, the process moved from principle to draft, done by the, by the constitutional experts in that particular area, and then the integration of the legal um, um, drafts into one consistent document. And that was done by having a refinement committee um, of drafters. Um, the principal drafter in that particular committee was um, Phil Knight, and that's why we have a plain language um, constitution which is both at the level of content, I, I think a very fine document, but also at the level of readability, ex certainty, accessibility. It is, it is genuinely a people's constitution. Um, what I think was important, what are the important issues from the final constitution, and I'm gonna try and draw this all together now, is that um, there was prior deliberation on the, and agreement on style and usage. Not just gonna adopt the old way of doing things, it was a specific um, agreement on how this constitution was to be drafted. There was a separation of roles. F the politicians facilitated. The expertise um, existed in the um, technical committees and the drafting took place um, by the drafters. 
So there was those three roles that I spoke about earlier, expertise, facilitation, and, uh, and um, drafting um, were, were separated out. And I think in a, in, 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 uh, in, in a set of negotiations as complex as this, that that, that was the, um, the appropriate way. I want to very briefly deal with the social accords and to say that this is now, I want to give an example of a less complicated process. Um, um, and this is a generalized dis description of what has taken place in, in, um, in, 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 um, in a number of the SADC countries. Um, and there would be a task force appointed. We never had complicated structures of plenaries and caucuses and committees and the like, because you're talking to um, approximately eight, 10, sometimes 16 people. The interests were diverse, however. There were different federations representing labor, don't have a single um, um, Labour Federation representing all, all trade unions in, in, in the country. Employers represent very different interests, from small business um, to the very large uh, mining companies. And within the state, there were differences. Um, partly, our history is that, there, um, that many of some of these states have um, a socialist history. And what you find is that the, the remnants of socialism um, remain in the ministries of labor and the, um, and the, 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 the new globalized, um, globalization um, exponents are in the department ministries of finance and, uh, and trade and industry. And so don't think this is just dealing with three players. This is effectively this process sometimes dealt with seven, eight, nine, and quite difficult interests to, to manage. In all of these um, was the use of an independent and outside person, um, expertise in labor law, um, facil facilitation techniques, skills, and drafting techniques. And it was all wrapped up in one. So although in a complicated um, process you might want to separate those roles, um, in a less complicated situation um, you, um, you need not do so. There was again, was explicit agreement on the process before the commencement of the negotiations. Again, there was the first stage was to say, how are we going to get agreement and how are we going to give legal expression to that agreement? And, and it's, it was in by asking those questions and bringing it to the fore that, I, that, that a real discussion emerged to how it should be done. Um, I might say in, in a different context um, in which I was working, um, everyone was happy with the lawyer representing one of the parties because of his reputation. And in a sense they said, you are going to chair, you are going to, you've got the expertise and you are going to draft. Um, but when you do all that, you're going to have to be independent of the client that you represent. Now, I think some lawyers are capable of that, um, but it requires a, a large degree of trust. Um, um, to allow that to happen. In most instances, um, that doesn't take place. So, and the way in which the independent facilitator um, operated was to lead the deliberations on policies and recorded agreements. Very often we think of the drafter as someone who waits for somebody to give him an instruction. I think what you're looking at here is you're dealing with what I call the active, activist drafter, a drafter who engages and um, basically f um, secures consensus on instructions, those instructions then to um, permit him or her to um, produce um, a, legal, a legal draft. I make the point that traditional mediation techniques um, become very important to resolve disputes as you go through this process. The independent facilitator prepared the draft, um, giving effect to the agreements. This is a single text, what they call in um, in ADR, single text um, mediation. You put the text and then the parties work off the text. Parties can bring their own texts. Um, parties have their lawyers present and negotiate the text, but they, you do it, you work off the text that the, the um, what I call the activist drafter um, and puts before um, and the party. Then finally, I think if we look at the principles of drafting and complex, what can we, what can we draw from, I, th I, th I think, that experience? And, and I think it is reproducible in other, in, in other contexts, um, some parts of them. 
Um, I think there's always a need for pre-negotiation agreement on structures, roles, and processes. And even if there isn't agreement, at least you should think about it. And it means thinking about it, you might say to yourself, we're just going to run the ordinary way with this, difficult and complex as it is. Um, but if you think about it, it may be that one will be able to um, work out timelines, processes, ways of trying to deal with um, um, producing um, a, legal, a legal draft. As I said, there's, you'll need those three um, interrelated roles and skills. They can be wrapped up in one person, they can be divided in two, they can be divided in three. But the roles must be integrated um, um, in the sense that might, different people might do it. You've, you actually have to have your drafter present in the process throughout the um, negotiations. This is not a matter of getting consensus and then handing that consensus to a drafter in the back room and the drafter quietly works away and then produces a text. Because part of this process is, is an evolution of a text. And um, generally speaking, what I've, what I've noticed is that you, you produce a first lay draft, then a second draft, then a third draft. And in other words, actual pr production of drafts creates an evolving consensus um, um, over time. As I, again, I'm jumping at the use of a single evolving text as the basis of securing agreement. And I think it's important to recognize that consensus evolves. And again, these are the themes I've dealt with earlier, that um, you don't tie anyone down until that person puts a signature at the end of the process. And although people are often worried about that, psychologically, it becomes very difficult to raise an issue late in the process. And what will happen if you've got 10 or 15 points that you still want to have an argument about on the night before the agreement is to be concluded, you can be quite sure that what will happen is that the party will prioritize um, the points, drop the others, and you end up dealing with maybe two or three major issues um, um, in dispute. Um, and there's nothing quite like time pressure um, and, um, and a facilitator who doesn't let parties go to bed until such time as agreement is, um, is reached. We, we uh, are past masters of that where we come from. We call it negotiation by exhaustion. And um, if you want to know something about the miracle, South Africa was not a miracle. South Africa was a hell of a hard, hell of a hard work, enormous courage by a range of people, and a lot of late nights and sometimes no sleep at all over several days. So bear in mind when people say, talk about the miracle and about how we negotiate, let me tell you, negotiation isn't a pleasant process and you don't sleep. Um, I, and I think with Phil and I in the last days of the, of the final constitution, um, we, we were talking about no sleep over the space of about five days. I mean, other than, you know, I'm sleeping on the, on, on the seats in parliament while we were waiting for a committee to finish its work. Um, but the, uh, uh, I think that's what you're dealing with, with enormously complex um, um, situations. I think um, it's fundamental that the working drafts are transparent. And one of the implications, I think, of this process is that, um, is that if you have an independent drafter, um, it's the, that drafter must bring to each of the parties the implications of the draft. If you're drafting bilaterally for a client and the other um, side is happy with the wording, even though you know that there's, um, it, there are a range of implications, implications that obviously suit you, um, you, you're not beholden to raise those implications um, to the other side. They have lawyers, they can look after their own interests, they don't do it, they miss it, well, great for your client. But when you deal with this type of, um, in this type of environment, the independent um, um, drafter is, a, I think, ethically obliged to raise um, each implication with each party. And of course, that raises the importance of having a plain text, um, a text that makes those, um, brings those implications to the fore, but realized in doing that, that of course you raise sticking points. And um, very often um, other parties are, um, un, um, are not uh, too happy when, when um, um, issues that they rather like to leave asleep are, 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 are roughly woken up by the, by the independent drafter. Um, um, Finally, I think those, those points there are, just flow from the, from the role. 
And the last slide, assessment of the legal text, can I just say very briefly, the peace accord was more collegial in its manner in which it was dealt with, but it was not coherent and not consistent. The interim constitution, um, the drafters were removed and um, a very dissatisfied, more coherent, but um, a very a great deal of dissatisfaction um, um, on, on the part of the politicians who, who drafted it. The final constitution became integrated in the drafting process because of the um, um, continual interaction between the drafters and the, um, and the process of negotiation. Um, I think a, a truly beautiful um, and certain constitution um, was drafted. And I think the same thing applies to the social courts. In other words, I think there are benefits for drafting, depending on the process um, that you deal with um, in a multilateral um, environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Halton, for sharing that important historic experience uh, with us. And it is my pleasure now to introduce to you the Honorable Mr. Justice Jim Carnwath. Mr. Justice Carnwath practiced uh, in a general practice in Woodstock from 1962 to 1980. His date of call until he was appointed to the bench as senior judge in the district court. He went on to the Ontario Superior Court and was regional senior justice Central West from 1994 to 1999. In 2000, he became supernumerary. He was the chair of the Education Committee, Canadian Institute for the Administration of Justice, for 10 years. And he was responsible for the organization staffing and course content of the Judicial Writing Seminar for federally appointed judges. He's lectured to courts across Canada on judicial writing for the National Judicial Institute and co-authored with Madam Justice Louis Mayo, um, Decisions, Decisions, a Handbook on Judicial Writing, 1998. So we're very pleased to have uh, Mr. Justice Carnwath with us today to share his insights on effective legal drafting. Please join me in welcoming our honor, Mr. Justice Carnwath. Now, in New York every year, there is a special mass for the New York Police Department and the New York Fire Department. And of course, the congregation is half Italian and half Irish, and they all know the drill about the mass. The archbishop was being fitted up with one of these things, and he said, there's something wrong with this microphone. And the congregation answered in one voice, and with you also. <laughs> Normally, I would take five minutes to warm you up, but we have time constraints. I'm going to hurry, and as a reward for coming, and to get you on my side, I'm going to give you absolutely free the best collection letter in North America. Dear sir, re 
agree your unpaid account with me. If you do not pay this account bloody forthwith, I shall take such action as shall cause you the utmost damned astonishment. <laughs> now that's, that's my kind of drafter and writer, I must say. I have two disclaimers. The first is the tension between the terms of art folks and the plain language folks is something I don't plan to address. As soon as you get into a discussion of plain language, the terms of art people jump out of the bushes and say, you know, these are time-tested phrases and don't you meddle with those or we won't know how to advise our clients. So I'm going to steer clear of that. But I suggest to you, you do other kinds of drafting besides commercial drafting and legislative drafting. You send letters to your clients and to your friends on the other side of the lawsuit. You prepare memoranda for your senior or for your junior. You prepare facta. And these are the opportunities I suggest to you where you have a chance to put a human face on the practice of law and your profession in the administration of justice. So that's the first disclaimer. I do say a word to the legislative drafters when you get together this afternoon. Remember what Lord Mildew said in one of P.G. Woodhouse's novels. If Parliament doesn't mean what it says, it should say so. <laughs> the other disclaimer is this. We don't have time to think about how words can wound. But we are custodians of our language, and we have an enormous obligation as members of this profession to avoid using words that wound, words that exclude. And I exhort you to take whatever courses are available to you on such issues as gender neutrality and that sort of thing. The time is long past when we should talk about firemen and policemen. Long past, and thereby exclude 50% or more of the people to whom we're speaking. Imagine writing a letter to your friend in some lawsuit saying, your client is turning a blind eye to our requirements, only to find that your friend is visually impaired. How would you feel? Words can wound. It's our responsibility to avoid wounding, if at all possible. I will close on the terms of art debate, just so you know where I stand, as unlike Philip Knight, <coughs> I am a judge. I've been one for 23 years, and I do like plain language, make no mistake. But here's what John Kenneth Galbraith said almost 25 years ago. I have always gained much help in writing and economics by the conviction that there is no idea associated with the subject that cannot, without suffi with sufficient effort, be stated in clear English. The obscurity that characterizes professional economic prose does not derive from the difficulty of the subject, but is the result of incomplete thought, or it reflects a priestly desire to differentiate oneself from the plain world of the layman, or it stem, stems from the fear of having one's inadequacies found out. Nothing so protects error as an absence of readers or understanding. Wow! I'm with him. One little note. In 1978, he still felt comfortable saying, layman. I don't think he would today. But that's my take on plain language. I have a friend who I think describes herself as an ardent feminist. He says, I don't mind if you call it a manhole cover, considering where it leads. <laughs> We're going to talk about three things plus an exhortation. Openings, 
jargon, and revision. And that takes us to the first contest. I'm going to read to you a set of facts, and at the end of that reading, I'm going to <coughs> ask you some questions. You may make notes. You may take notes if you wish. Here is the story. Screech Construction Limited, with head office in St. John's, Newfoundland, is the head of contractor to build a sky dome in Toronto. Screech is building for Gold Eye Limited, a Winnipeg company incorporated in Manitoba. Construction starts June 15, 1988. June 15, 1988. On May 13, 1989, the Mayor of Toronto was entertaining the Premier of Alberta in a hospitality suite at the Dome. During a demonstration of unrolling the baseball carpet, the Premier of Alberta is struck by a forklift truck resulting in a broken leg. The head office of the carpet subcontractor is in Montreal, and two days before had been placed in bankruptcy. Carpet contractor leased the forklift truck company from a company in Pocatello, Idaho, which latter is a wholly owned subsidiary of an Afghanistan parent. <laughs> what is this case about, Council? Broken leg? Do you agree with your colleagues? A case about a broken leg? Insurers, what do you think the case is about? Slip and fall. Why are these dates here? Is it a prescription case? Why, what are all these companies doing all over Hell's Half Acre? Is it a conflict of laws case? Warranty? Did you? Forum, convenience forum, a little Latin there, lovely. Well, I put it to you, you haven't the faintest idea what this case is about. <laughs> you haven't the faintest idea. And that leads me to the second contest. I am going to put some letters on the screen. And you are going to attempt to remember as many of the letters as you can. This is to persuade you that you haven't the faintest idea of how we read. We have no idea of how we read. We think we take those little black marks up off the page, sort of transform them somehow in our head, and there's cat. It's not like that at all. Now, for this contest, if you're up to the mark. The prize is, I will give you the best palindrome in the world. How's that for a deal, all right? The best palindrome in the world for playing the game. Okay. Now, remember that this is going to happen very quickly. So you have to be alert. I want you to tell me what you see. Well, upside down? Oh, my God. And I was making fun of the. Uh, Oh, my goodness. Well, then, here we go again. What did you see? WRTZ. WRTZ? I'm sorry? AQ. AQ? Anybody else? Well, this experiment, under perfect conditions, people of your level of intelligence, normally get about five letters. And what you saw was that. Okay. Now, 
We're going to do this, only we're going to go a little faster, and I want you to tell me what you see. This will be fast. Catch, yes. Break. Quill. Dog. Thank you, thank you. You're, you're, you're hitting the, the results, the statistical results, right in the middle. And it looked like catch, break, dog, quill, fight. Well now, this is the, this is the biggie, and this is faster yet, okay? <laughs> if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now what's going on here? How is it that the first time you get five out of 25, Second time, with a little help from your colleagues, you may get 15 or 20. Here, in the twinkling of an eye, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Anybody care to take a guess at what's happening? This is psycholinguistics. I thought you'd, thought you'd like that. Yes, sir. Patterns of, Patterns of recognition. That's very close. That's very close. Anybody else? What you expect to see. Yeah, you expect to see. Reading, say the psycholinguists, is a psycholinguistic guessing game where we roam over the text predicting, predicting what will come next. We don't look at the bottom half of a printed text, because if you put a ruler over the top half, all you'll see will be little jiggly lines like that. We look at the top half. We don't look at the vowels. Arabic is a language in which there are no vowels. If you take the consonants out of a text, all you get is E-I-E-I-O, it's old MacDonald. But if you take the vowels out, you can still make most of the sense. And the psycholinguists tell us that we bop along from the tops of the consonants and we check in with the text every now and then to see if we guessed right. What does that tell us about what our job is? It tells us that we have to help the reader guess right all the time. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Blue Riding Hood. Whew. You stop, your eye goes back, you've been deflected from predicting correctly because someone has taken you out of guessing correctly, threw in a blue. So the opening that I read to you, devoid of issues, is of no help. And if you remember nothing from this fast league ending presentation, remember this. The first paragraph says it all. Who did what to whom? What are the issues to be decided? Who did what to whom? What are the issues to be decided? Let me read to you a, the opening of a judgment by the nicest man in Canada, Peter Corey. Theodore Steele, the respondent, has attained the age of 55. For almost 37 of those years, he has been detained in an institution. In my view, the issue raised on this appeal is whether the parole board erred in refusing to release him on parole with the result that his continuing imprisonment constitutes cruel and unusual punishment. The period of incarceration has been long indeed. When the respondent entered prison, Mr. Saint Laurent was Prime Minister and General Eisenhower was President. He remained incarcerated through the Cuban Missile Crisis, the assassination of President Kennedy, the Vietnam War, the FLQ Crisis, the Watergate scandal, the Iran-Iraq War, the easing of tension between the Soviet Union and the United States, and the enactment of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. An era has passed. What do you think he did with them? <laughs> do you think he kept them in jail? <laughs> I don't think so. 
That's powerful writing. Imagine someone in the Court of Appeal picking up a factum based on this set of facts and reading those first two paragraphs. Talk about getting a panel's attention. Talk about making your case in the first paragraph. That's the kind of writing that is possible, of which we're capable, if we work at it. So if you have a chance with a document to make an opening in the first paragraph, seize it. This is your one chance to get the reader's attention. This is prime real estate. Don't put a hot dog stand on prime real estate. <laughs> Don't waste the chance, if the chance is there. And then we have to take a quick detour through jargon. There are no rules. These are options you have. But if you can, in whatever you're drafting, if you can talk to your neighbor over the back fence, or talk to your mom, then that's the level of language that I think you should try and attain. Has anyone here ever met a police officer who got out of a car? Anybody? You have. You're the first one in 15 years. What does a police officer do? Exit he exits the vehicle. Exactly. And having exited the vehicle, what does the police officer do next? Does the officer go to the house? He proceeds or attends at the residence. All right. We taught them. We taught them to speak like that. They don't speak like that. We taught them that. They come to court. They want to put their Sunday best on. And they've heard us, the lawyers and the judges, speaking in this jargon language where people exit their vehicles and proceed or attend at residences. May I ask you, madam, what is the difference between null and void? No difference. Does anyone disagree with that analysis of null and void? What is the difference between cease and desist? No difference? No. I don't think so. Do any of you remember Robertson Cochran, who wrote the language paper for the Globe and Mail on Saturday mornings for years and years and years? He died about two years ago. And he, he dealt with this topic called redundancy. So he wound up by saying, well, that's all well and good, you say, joining in the spirit of things. But doesn't each and every one of us indulge in this hemming and hawing sometimes? And I'd have to say, yes. Examples in common speech are not few and far between in this day and age. <laughs> by hook or by crook, time and tide wait for no one with one thing and another. We pick and choose at odds and ends. Remaining outwardly calm, cool, and collected, we struggle with might and main to be fair and square, tread the straight and narrow, and avoid rack and ruin. But when push comes to shove, and we've looked at all the whys and wherefores, it's best to have a last will and testament so that our heirs and successors won't have to slug it out with other kith and kin. And with that, before somebody smites me hip and thigh, I'll cease and desist. <laughs> Those are the doublets and the triplets. And I think we could maybe save 66% by dropping two words out of three. Someone mentioned Latin this morning. I think, uh, David, was it you that you, you and I share the same view of Latin? And there is a professor in the United States. <laughs> I can't tell you where he is because he's asked me to stop. <laughs> doing this, but <laughs> he, uh, he hates Latin, and he teaches his law students to abhor Latin. And one of his uh, 
One of his methods is that he created a list of Latin phrases that we all know. And instead of giving them their normal meaning, he gave them his personal meaning. So that, for instance, habeas corpus, you have a body. He said, no, no, Professor White said, no, no, that's, that was a conversation opener in a Roman disco. Huh? <laughs> and respondeat superior, you remember that? You answer to the top. Respondeat superior. No, no, says Professor White, it's not like that at all. Respondeat superior is an old custom in the state of Maine where, in circumstances of conjugal intimacy, the person on top answers the telephone. You see? <laughs> so why would I trouble you with this? Why would I trouble with this? I want you to remember that the next time you're tempted to say inter alia, right, which sounds like a disease to me, say among other things. This is, as I'm sure you're aware, a multicultural society where many folks are working in English as a second or even a third language. We do not need to create barriers of, mis of understanding by speaking in Latin. We can, we've got our law degree, right? we can relax, we can forget about it. We don't need the Latin. And if you're ever tempted, think of Professor White and leave it out. In your um, excursions through the precedents contained in our legal literature, let me ask you what you do when you come to that indented, single-spaced excerpt from one of the great cases of all time. What do you do? What do you do with it? You're sworn to tell the truth. <laughs> You're reading through a law report somewhere. Some judge is writing something, or some student has prepared a memorandum, and there's a point to be made, and suddenly here is an excerpt from the Supreme Court of Canada, about that long, compressed so you don't have to put quotes around it, single-spaced. So that's the one you skip. That's right. We all skip it. It's a secret, but we skip it. You know. <laughs> so somewhere, I mean, what this tells the reader is there's something in there that's worthwhile. Go find it. Right? Go find it. This is not helpful for the reader. So what does the reader do? The reader says, <laughs> go find it. <laughs> yes, that famous expression involving sex and travel. You know. So. I just say that the opportunity will come from time to time to put a human face on what you do, and if the chance comes, take it. You have an opportunity, like Peter Corey had, to let your personality come out. And if it's a, an occasion for compassion, as it was in that case, then by all means seize it if you can. I want to talk to you briefly about revision. Writing is revision. Writing is not speech written down. Once we've said it, as we've learned to our sorrow, we can't bring it back. We can't revise speech. But we do have a chance to revise what we say. And on the question of revision, let me show you a, a beautiful legal sentence. It's just a humdinger. It's got a nice roll to it. Eh? Each and every one of us is in need of assistance. Now, you've got to admit that that's pretty good stuff. How many like this sentence? Anybody like it? No. What would you do to fix it? We all need help.
he's not a plant. Eh? <laughs> I've never seen him before in my life. <laughs> but uh, he broke the rules by, by talking into my game. <laughs> of course, we all need help. And the, what is called by a writer named Mercy, the mind and the body. A writer named Lanham, Richard Lanham, who wrote a wonderful book called Revising Prose. He said, think of the lard factor that you've taken out of that prior sentence. Each and every one of us is in need of assistance. One, two, three, four. Eleven words. We're down to four. This is good stuff. And the thing with revising, of course, is if we're not careful, stuff happens. And um, we are either embarrassed or worse. Let's give me a couple of examples of what happens if we fail to revise. The defendant was arrested for fornicating under a little used statute. Very nice, eh? <laughs> Sometimes called the neatest trick of the week. How about, my client has discussed your proposal to fill the drainage ditch with his partners. <laughs> eh? I had a partner like that once. <laughs> and you like this one the best of all. Beyond being, uh, being beyond any doubt insane, the judge ordered the petitioner's transfer to a state mental hospital. What's happening here, of course, is that we are we're losing sight of the subject and the object of the sentence, and we're starting to stuff stuff in between, and suddenly we get a nonsense. And failing to revise is the sort of thing that leads to that kind of error. So that writing is revision, it's not speech written down, and I can just take three minutes to give you what is called by Mr. Lanham the paramedic method of revision. We are not script doctors, we're not paid enormous sums of money to fix other people's writings, we can only try and fix our own. But here is, absolutely free, a splendid way to start to get the hang of revising. Number one, take your text and circle all the versions of the verb to be. Is, are, was, were, am, be, been. All right? Circle them all. Second, Circle all the prepositions, the ins and the ofs, the overs, the unders, whatever. All right. Take a swing at the that, especially if you use a, a microphone, a dictaphone, because we fall into the defendant said that when all we need to say is the defendant said he went to the show. We don't need to say the defendant said that he went to the show. And if you look at your text on a page, you will find upwards of 15 that's. So now that we've looked at the is, are, was, were, am, be, bins, and the prepositions, as in each and every one of us is in need of assistance, what do we find? We find, first of all, that there is an is verb there that is concealing a real verb, which we have nominalized in this jargon that we speak. We take an ordinarily useful verb and we turn it into a noun by sticking a preposition in front of it. So we have each and every one of us, of us, is in need. And we can take the of us and we say, who's of us? Well, that's, that's us, that's we. Because we are now going to have an active verb and not a passive verb. So the third or fourth prescription for the paramedic revision is 
find out who is kicking whom. Find out the action in the verb, and then use it. The car was driven over the cliff by the accused. No, no, no. The accused drove the car over the cliff. Each and every one of us is in need of assistance. No, no, no. We all need help, and we do. So there's the paramedic. Try it on some brilliant piece that you've written, and um, see what happens. After you circle the ises, the prepositions, the thats, oh, and, the, and the ations, the rationalizations. There's a verb in there. Rationalize. Sanctification. There's a verb in there. Sanctify. Another little trick. I want to read you something that, uh, and this is, this is the last. This is a will that um, I found oh, about almost 20 years ago. I'll have to read it to you because among other things, couldn't type very well. I, George Harold Ross Goldthorpe, I wish for my check account to go to my brother, Reginald C. Goldthorpe, and his family, as we were split up after our mother's death. Reg and I were close. Our young brother and our older sister went to stay with our grandparents. Our baby sister went with mother, sister, as they were two, four, six years old. Our oldest brother was four years older than I. Reg and I went to school together. We stayed with our father, Thomas. Stayed with our father. Thomas, our oldest brother, soon went down to Toronto to our grandparents and two spinsters aunt. Thomas soon got work in Toronto. It was a tough time for us in those days. Dad did his best, but it was so lonely. We made it. Reg and myself came down in 1938 to see if we could find work in March, which we found out later was an off season. But we found work and did good. I went back home after harvest. Reg took other work and stayed down here. 1940, he married Mary Ann and had two children who have been very good to me. Mary Ann has the business head of the family. She has promised me that she will see that my wish are carried out. Reg Lloyd and Edith will get what I wished. I am in sound mind and body. In other words, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I hope this does not give Reg and Mary Ann any trouble. I will not know at this time just how much the bank account will be. Now, if George Harold Ross Goldthorpe, an illiterate laborer, can reveal himself to us, don't we want to know him? Don't we like him? Wouldn't we give our eye teeth to be able to talk to him? His character just shines through this simple document that he sat down and typed and so the exhortation is, of course, when you get the chance, when you get the chance, put a human face on your profession, put a human face on what you do, and give it your best shot. Thanks very much. I want to thank uh, the speaker for uh, those brilliant uh, examples. I, I want to make this one comment. When I quoted um, the English Parliamentary Council, Edward Caldwell, and said, uh, our writing by necessity is often boring, um, I didn't know I was so soon going to uh, see him proven wrong. 
He was, of course, referring to legislation and necessarily uh, is devoid of some of those things. I would recommend to you, uh, on the subject of openers, um, get an extraordinarily good article written by uh, the American uh, legal linguist uh, Brian Garner. Uh, the article is called Framing the Deep Issue. It appears in a mid-1990s, I can't remember the exact citation, uh, issue of the Scribes Journal of Legal Writing. Uh, if you want a more precise citation, write to me at my email address, which I think is in the materials, and I'll let you know how to find that. But the, uh, the arguments um, for, uh, for openings uh, and persuasive openings are very extremely well set out, along with a number of other examples. Now, we are um, approaching the lunch break, but I'm to offer you some time for uh, comments back or questions. Um, so if you have questions and would like to uh, address them to any of the speakers from this morning, please, this is your opportunity. Um, if you just want to go for lunch, look anxious and maybe your colleagues won't ask questions either. <laughs> uh, it's the Scribes Journal of Legal Writing. Scribes Journal is an American publication. It's, uh, uh, as the name implies, about legal language. Uh, it publishes twice a year. Um, and I don't have a copy of it with me, so I can't give you the, uh, the particulars. And the uh, title of the article is called Framing the Deep Issue. The author's name is Brian Garner. You may find it on his own website. His website is to be found at, uh, I think, www.lawprose. Lawprose is L-A-W-P-R-O-S-E. Yes? We never got the palindrome. While we wait for the palindrome, let me tell you that the best palindrome I've ever heard came from a five-year-old child who said, um, 101, Mom, you know, it's a palindrome. <laughs> who knew a palindrome could be a number? Any more questions? Okay, it's time for salami and lasagna. We'll see you at uh, 1.15.